Okay, so you should be seeing a PowerPoint presentation on the Research Starts Here series, and thank you very much to the Research Office for having me. Um, I'm here mostly to talk about the tri-agency uh, funding requirements, but this will touch on some other areas as well that can be applied outside of just tri-agency grants. So we, uh, we recently did a little audit of how we're doing in terms of our tri-agency grant um, requirements, if we're actually complying with the requirements, particularly with the open access policy. And our score was 54%. So since the open access policy has come into place, 54% of you Winnipeg researchers, according to publicly available data, have made uh, their research available in ways that complies with the policy. This isn't a super high number. It's actually much higher than the national average, though the national average is only 25%. So we're doing what we can to bump everybody up and, and get us into a, a slightly better rate of compliance with the policy, not just because it's policy, but also because there's, there's good reason for the policy existing and we do want to make sure that our research is freely accessible. So I've kind of got some general tips to think through and again these can be general tips they don't just apply to tri-agency grants um, but the policy I'll talk about the most will be the tri-agency policy. So the first thing is that actually even though publication is often very late in the research process it's something that we have to think about when we're writing our grants themselves. And Knowing the policy, if it is tri-agencies, knowing the tri-agency open access policy, or knowing other policies in the grant you're applying for is really crucial when you're making the actual application. The section that we usually put open access is in the impact and knowledge mobilization section. And I do really encourage people to think about this deeply as part of the grant writing process. It's not just an afterthought or a check mark or you know, a box that we're making sure to check. It's really actually central to our entire research project. It's thinking about how we're going to make sure that the academics or the practitioners or the policymakers or the general public who needs to know this information can get it. And that involves sometimes creative thinking in terms of how we're going to assess our own impact or how we're going to mobilize that knowledge. Um, and it does also typically mean that this is where we talk about our, our plans for disseminating our research results to the greater public or, or in an open access form. It's also really important, even though you're still just at the very beginning of a hypothetical grant of a hypothetical research project, to think about your hypothetical publications that you might be making and what journals you might be making them in. And the reason for this is because you don't want to end up at the end of your project with no way to comply with the policy. So you really want to make sure that you're asking what copyrights you're going to retain with any journals you publish, if you're allowed to self-archive, and I'll get into that more later, if they have a paid open access option and other um, publication charges. So uh, some journals will charge page setting costs, they'll charge extra fees for things like images and stuff like that. And those are really important to know up front when you're writing your grant because all of those charges can be included in your budget. Those are all considered eligible charges to the tri-agencies. And because they kind of tend to start at around $3,000 and go up from there, you do want to make sure that you've got the money to cover it. The other option is to look into if there's something called Diamond Open Access, which is a no-fee open access journal, something that's uh, open access for everyone to read and doesn't pay publishers. Um, and those options are out there too. And that's something that I can help with um, and John Dobson, the scholarly communications specialist can help with as well. And then after you've done all of this thinking, <laughs> it, you know, it gets boiled down to three sentences that you put in your grant application. But it's really important to include that language to show that you are thinking deeply about how you are going to make sure that the general population, the general public, and, and all those people who just don't happen to subscribe to that one particular journal you may publish in can have access to your results. The bad news is, is you're not done thinking about it. Then at the end, when it comes time to publish, you also have to think about it again. So as you're signing your publication agreement, my biggest wish is that everyone thinks of me <laughs> when they sign their publication agreement. I'm always happy to look over your publication agreement with you and to help negotiate things like an author's addendum or make sure that your publication agreement helps retain the rights that you need in order to meet your grant requirements. Um, I know 
I know from experience that it's all too easy to just sign it, send it back into the ether and never look at it again. It's also really important to keep a copy of that publication agreement. We actually have had instances where journals have tried to claim that authors didn't have the right to do things that they did have the right to do in their agreement. Um, so having that copy of the agreement was incredibly crucial to, to prove what had actually been signed. The other horrible piece of advice, and I say horrible because it's really good advice, but it's really hard to follow, <laughs> is to keep all the drafts of your work and especially clearly label that final accepted version. And often that's not something that we're sending out. That's something that's been sent back to us. It's been sent back after peer review. It's been sent back after copy editing. It's that final accepted version of the text before it gets formatted. And that version is what becomes crucial because that's what we're seeing more and more journals are actually allowing to be posted open access. So once you have that, you can send it to us immediately. Even if the journal you've published with says that there's an embargo on that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go too, but you can send it to us immediately and we can send, put it into WinSpace and set the embargo. And finally, even after all of the publication, you can talk to us. If you've got something on WinSpace, we can help pull statistics and things like that to help show the impact of that open access piece. So this really has most bearing when we talk about the tri-agency open access policy on publication. And what is it? <coughs> Excuse me. It specifically applies to peer-reviewed journal publications. And it says that grant recipients are required to ensure that any peer-reviewed journal publications arising from agency-supported research are freely accessible within 12 months of publication. And it sets out two different ways you can do this. You can do this with the online repository. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about WinSpace. Grant recipients can deposit their final peer-reviewed manuscript. So this is really key. This is, you do have to make sure that it's that <laughs> accepted manuscript into an institutional or disciplinary repository that makes the FET manuscript freely available within 12 months of publication. It's also the responsibility of you as the grant recipient, although I am here to help, to determine which publishers allow authors to retain copyright and or allow authors to self-archive journal publications in accordance with this policy. The other route is that grant recipients can publish in a journal that offers immediate open access or that offers open access on its website within 12 months. So some journals will require you to pay the article processing charge to make manuscripts manuscripts freely available. And as I mentioned, you can include those costs in your budget. And, and finally, the tri-agencies say these routes are not mutually exclusive. You're strongly encouraged, um, especially if you've paid for something to be open access, then you do automatically have the right to do this. You're strongly encouraged to deposit a copy into an online repository immediately available, uh, immediately upon publication, even if the article is freely available on the journal's website. One of the major reasons for this is because our institutional repository, WinSpace, has a number of built-in preservation features. It's designed to live beyond the life of the university, even, providing continual access to those publications. Um, journals, unfortunately, sometimes do disappear, uh, and with that, your work can disappear. So making that redundant copy is actually a really good way to ensure that it, it persists. And then finally, the, the standard language that you must acknowledge um, where you got the grant from in all publications. CIHR specifically also has a requirement for data. Um, I'm not going to go over this as much, but it's important to know. And it's important to know that SHRC actually also have a data policy. Um, it's from 1990. <laughs> and it does also say that, open, that they want the open, open publication of data whenever possible. Um, these are all going to be supplanted very soon with the new uh, research data management policy from the tri-agencies. And Jamie Orr, who's on the call actually today, will I'm sure keep you updated when that does change. So those two routes that I mentioned, going through a repository and going through journals, have, have their own names too. We call going through repositories green open access. And we really encourage you to use WinSpace, our institutional repository. And this is language that you can write into your grant as well. So you can say that you intend to deposit a copy with WinSpace. 
It's indexed by um, a very pow powerful database now called Unpaywall. And Unpaywall is used by things like Scopus and all kinds of academic library catalogs. So it actually means that that, that article from WinSpace can be seen in academic libraries all over the world. It's also indexed by Google Scholar, which means that it's also freely available and easy to find on the internet. Um, so for people who are maybe not affiliated with an institution, work for nonprofits, those kinds of things, that Google Scholar visibility is actually a really big benefit to, to an institutional repository like WinSpace. It means it's not just hidden away in the academic library catalogs, but it does have this bigger visibility. Um, so you can also post it in disciplinary repositories, depending on your discipline. Um, there's things like archive or, bi or bio archive, um, PubMed and a number of different disciplinary institutions or disciplinary repositories rather. But um, it's important to note that things like ResearchGate and academia.edu are not considered repositories and they do not help you meet this policy. Uh, the other note, and I mentioned this before, they require that postprint or publisher's PDF. They require a version specifically that is after the full peer review. And so to find out if you can publish in a journal of your choice that might not be open access, that might be completely paywall paywalled, but also use the self-archiving option, there's a website called Sherpa Romeo that you can look it up on to see. And I'll show you an example of that as we go. You can also ask us <laughs> if you're interested in publishing in a journal, it's a paywalled journal, it's not open access, there's no option to make it open access, I can help you and look through over, look over their policies and see if it will allow you to deposit to WinSpace and meet this requirement that way. The other option is to publish in either gold or diamond open access journals. So you can publish in a hybrid journal. This is incredibly common right now where we'll see that journals um, the entire volume or issue might be closed and paywalled, but individuals can pay for particular articles to be made open access. Again, you want to know what those fees are and include them in your budget. There are also many fully open access journals that the entire journal is going to be open access, not just your article. They sometimes have fees. If they don't, then they're, they're sort of a diamond OA journal. Um, and we do have some tips when it comes to assessing these. Um, on our page, Assessing a Journal Publisher on the Research and Scholarship part of the library website. There's also the Directory of Open Access Journals, which keeps a, a list and, and sort of maintains certain standards that open access journals have to, uh, to follow. And also, this is something that I'm always happy to do. Um, John Dobson and I, when people are preparing grants, will often do a landscape analysis. So if you're not aware of the open access options, you can give us lists of journals you're interested in. We'll try and find out if there are fees associated with it, if it's a possibility. If not, we can provide alternative options too. Um, and this is an example of if you do want to look it up yourself, of the kind of results that you get back from this website, Sherpa Romeo. So in this, uh, this particular journal, it tells me a lot of information when I click on those little pluses. It's telling me if there's a published version, um, I can tell from the icons that the pound sign means that you have to pay to make a published version open access. But once you've paid, you are allowed to put it in your institutional repository, um, personal website, and other databases. Once you've paid, you get a Creative Commons license on it, um, which means you can either be Creative Commons by or Creative Commons non-commercial which allows for reuse, but you would always be cited as the author. Both of the, because both of the published versions require payment, I was more interested in seeing what the free versions were. So for this version, for the accepted version, that's the text version before formatting, there's no fee for it. There's also no embargo period for it. And you retain your copyright. And once, um, once that has been published, you are allowed to put it on your homepage, as well as an institutional repository or a named repository. So this journal, you can either pay, and I think the fee for this one is $3,500, so you put that into your grant. Um, you can either pay to have it published open access, or you have the option of using the accepted version, as long as you keep track of it. <laughs> with no embargo, so it can be made immediately freely available on Wednesday.
When it comes to picking a journal, some people um, are particular ner particularly nervous about open access journals. I will say in my experience, really, it's the same things that we consider for open access journals, just as we consider for paywall journals. So in both circumstances, there are unscrupulous publishers who are just trying to make a quick dollar. And in both circumstances, there are incredibly ethical, scholar-led, wonderful examples of publishing too. So the things I tend to think about, and everyone has different publication considerations, and I think that that's really important to stress that that's valid. Um, it, it is appropriate for different projects to have different priorities. So things that I always like to think about are the visibility, which to me is actually things like, is it properly indexed? Is that article gonna show up in the places that I want it to show up so people can find it and read it? And impact, is it reaching the community of people I want to reach it? So in some ways, open access journals can reach any community you want, but it's also, it, it is completely valid to remember that particular journals have a community of readership. Um, in librarianship, I particularly, read almost everything that a journal called In the Library with the Lead Pipe puts out because I really like the types of scholarship that they try to find. And you want to find that community of scholars too. They might be an open access community, they might not be. Um, same thing for rigorous standards. That peer review and editing process is something that I personally really like having, <laughs> a rigorous review and copy editing. Not everyone wants that or needs that, and that's fine, but it is important to look into that when you're considering journals. Similarly, things like the retraction policies, which also speak to rigor um, and standards. And there are things like speed to publication that can vary quite widely among journals. And again, this is, we see this in open access as well as paywall journals. We're seeing more and more in, in some of those prestige journals, um, Nature, Elsevier, Wiley journals, that there are options where you can pay to speed up the review or to speed up the publication process. So if that is something that's important to you, again, trying to ascertain all of those costs before you submit your grant so there's no surprises at the end is really important. And finally, scope. Um, sometimes open access publishers are criticized for having too broad of a scope. Again, we see this with paywall journals as well. Sometimes that broad scope means that you've got a big community. So these are all up to you kind of conversations. Um, and I'm always happy to help find particular journals and, and publishers themselves in the area that are reputable. The other great resource for this is COPE, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics. And they, they are actually a standard for journals to hold themselves to. So how journals will deal with things like allegations of misconduct, authorship and contributorship, complaints and appeals, conflicts of interest, data and reproducibility, ethical oversight, intellectual property, journal management, the peer review process, and post-publication discussions. And thinking about all of these different aspects when you're looking at a new journal or when you're not familiar with can really help you get a feel for, for what they stand for and if it aligns with what you want. Finally, there is something, and I just always think this is kind of fun. I, I'm very skeptical of most measures of impact and influence, the journal impact factor, doesn't look at individual articles, it's sort of a giant overall number and it can be gamed actually very easily. Uh, and since there's a lot of money involved, people do game it. Um, but the Eigenfactor Index <laughs> appeals to the Winnipegger in me um, because what it does is it compares on one axis article influence score, so some sort of rough measure of how influential that journal is. And then on the other axis, it compares publication fees. So this is, they call it a tool for comparison shopping. So, you know, you can figure out your, your best deal for highest impact for lowest cost. Um, it's, it's interesting to look at too, because while there is clearly some correlation between them, it's certainly not um, a tight or linear one. The other thing that I'll just mention quickly is if you're working in partnerships with people basically anywhere else in the world, you're likely to encounter Plan S. Plan S and Coalition S is a giant coalition. I think they're now up to over 30, um, 30 funders. So mostly national funders, but some of those sort of uh, third zone funders like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or like the Wellcome Trust have all signed on to it. And it's got a number of principles and a number of standards that it's asking people to follow. And it is a lot stricter than the current tri-agency policy. So if you're partnering with people in other institutions, 
they might have even stricter open access requirements. Starting in 2021, Plan S is going to require immediate open access availability. So unlike the tri-agencies, which have that 12-month embargo period, Plan S requires an immediate deposit. So that means a lot of journals that right now comply with our tri-agency requirements will not be compliant with Plan S. It also requires the retention of copyright and for authors to have CC licenses for their own works. It requires transparent fees. So for journals that charge for open access articles, Plan S is saying, we want to know how you set that price and where that money is going. It also currently only applies to, to peer reviewed articles, but they have indicated that they're trying to figure it out in the future for book chapters um, and, and monographs. So that's something to keep an eye on too, because certainly uh, the tri agencies are watching that as well. And they have a commitment in it to end hybrid journals. So the journals that double dip, um, that charge an open access fee, but also are charging the paywalled subscription fee. Plan S has said in principle that that's not what they want to support. So journals who have that current model are supposed to be transitioning out of that model. And finally, Plan S includes compliance and sanctions for people who don't follow the policy. This is more common in other jurisdictions. Canada's compliance, as I mentioned, at 25% is one of the lowest. Um, so I, we do constantly hear murmurings from the tri-agencies that they might look into com compliance in the future, compliance mechanisms such as not granting grants if you haven't met um, the requirements of your previous grant. And with Plan S, that's the case for, for anyone who's publishing under that as well. Um, so the biggest thing that I want to make sure is clear is that I'm here to help. This is my main area of research itself. I do research on research. <laughs> um, and John Dobson as well, who's the scholarly communications specialist, is also an incredible wealth of information about this kind of thing. So if you do, you know, have to make quick decisions about what you're putting in your grant or where you're publishing, we're always happy to help. And that's the end of the presentation. And so I will stop screen sharing. And, oh, um, Janice has said to everyone, but I'll repeat it on the video that I've been a help with contracts. And that's great. I'm really happy to always look over your publication contracts and try and negotiate whatever we can. Nothing, you know, if we don't try, then we can't lose it. So any questions? you can unmute or put it in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Brianne. This is Lauren. Um, I'll turn my video on so you can see me as well. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could clarify, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but um, I just thought I would ask if you could clarify uh, with regards to Plan S um, and their requirement for immediate open access, that uh, will also allow uh, researchers to publish in green OA journals, correct? Because green OA allows for that immediate um, open access repository option. Um, it isn't necessarily, because I know uh, when Plan S originally came out, they were even stricter than they are now. Um, but I just, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask for a clarification on the, um, on requirements for researchers to publish in, is it only gold OA journals? Is it diamond OA journals? Or is green OA journal publication still permitted? Great question. Um, and it's caused a lot of confusion. <laughs> and I probably can't speak totally confidently on it, but from what I've seen from Coalition S, they've reiterated that they do want to maintain the green open access option, that that, that absolutely was not what they wanted to take off the table. They, they had initially, um, they had like really specific technical requirements for the repositories, um, including using JATS XML, which is just like, I mean, it's gobbledygook to most people, including a lot of people who run journals. Um, so they were, they were cutting out so many journals with that and they've walked back from that. The biggest thing, though, is that a lot of journals have policies that say you can do this green, you can self-archive only after six months or 12 months or 24 months. 
and that's the option that they they're closing off that it has to be that immediate um, non-embargoed deposit so it's still definitely an option but it probably is going to require I would say from what I anecdotally I would say 90% of journals to change their policies in order to meet it And, and just because I know that Lauren's asking this partially from the journal side, um, from the author side, uh, this is where that talking through your publication agreement is really important. Because I think most journals, if you contact them and say, hey, I want to publish with you, it's this great nationally funded research project, but you've got a policy that says I can't, they're going to work with you to try and make that happen. So, yeah. <laughs> we can, I was, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yes, I'm like in this weird position where I'm both asking um, for on the researcher side and as a journal side. So, yeah, I think that that thank you for that clarification. I was pretty sure that that was indeed the case. But, yeah, as things kind of shift so quickly, it's really uh, good to kind of keep on top of what um, what the new regulations are going to be. So thank you for the clarification. Yeah, always happy to. Um, and and PlanS isn't just relevant for your partners. It is quite possibly going to be on our horizon too. Um, we know that the tri-agencies are talking with people in Coalition S. It's sort of got so much momentum that um, it's, it's hard not to see them signing on to it at some point. I am very much hoping they don't do it in the middle of a pandemic, and I don't think they've indicated that. But it is something that I think we're going to see some changes coming too. So um, again, I'm here to help with that. And I, and I should also say, actually, it's interesting, I've come across industry grants that have these kinds of open access requirements in them, too. So it's not just tri-agency. We're starting to really see it across the board with different types of grants. Um, so. Christy? Hi, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I had two questions. Um, one of them might not be relevant to too many people, so if you could just point me in the right direction, that would be great. Um, you mentioned some CIHR data requirements, and I wanted to hear more about that, particularly as it pertains to qualitative data. Um, and second, um, we've talked a lot about journal articles, but uh, what is the expectation uh, for things like, uh, like monographs that, that come out of Tri-Council funding? Uh, those are two great questions. Uh, so Jamie Orr, who's on this call, is our new research data librarian. So she can definitely help you with some of those data requirements. The main thing with that is that there's no requirement to make open data that shouldn't be open. If that makes sense, right? And, and especially CIHR, they're dealing with personal health information. They're, they're, they're very careful about what kind of data is supposed to be open. But what they want to see is that those data sets are described somewhere so that there can be some process of accountability if it's necessary, and also on your end that they're maintained. So they have, the records have to be kept for at least five years after the end of the project. Um, we certainly suggest having a, a longer term plan than that even for data um, to really think about data as an important piece of that, that project as well. Um, so there is some information on our site about that, but Jamie's probably your best resource. And then the second question is actually, I could talk for hours about this. So it is only journal articles that are required, but they love it if it applies to anything else. So it's definitely a way to increase grant success, is to think about non-journal article outputs. And so it can be things like monographs or book chapters. Um, but even those sort of more ephemeral things, um, I'm really into open educational resources right now. So if you're doing any kind of teaching on that, making that teaching open and, and making it openly licensed is definitely a really good option. And those, the costs that are associated with that can also be written into grants. The issue with open book publications, so full open monographs, is that for the most part, and this isn't across the board, but for the most part, there's quite a, um, a price tag that often comes with them. So we can see that between six and $10,000. But the impact of a full open access book is also 
quite magnified too. So that's the kind of thing that if you're, if you're interested in publishing open access, there are a bunch of really fantastic open access monograph publishers out there now um, that, that are really uh, actually where <laughs> I read a lot of the books <laughs> and people teach from them so much more too because they can assign them to a whole class with no worries. Um, so I can certainly help find those kinds of publishers, but it's not required. It would be, I imagine, a bonus though in a grant application. It, um, the one thing about book chapters is that especially with British publishers, because of their internal national granting requirements, sometimes those book chapters will have similar um, allowances for the institutional repository. So, and, and if not, that's something we can sometimes negotiate. So you can find entire published books that, you know, still cost the $300 or whatever, but each individual chapter is available in an institutional repository. And, and Cambridge Press and those kinds of presses are, are very lenient typically about that. So yeah, they're kind of in between, exactly in between journal articles and, and monographs. And again, if you investigate that in advance and include that in your grant proposal, that's the type of thing that the tri-agencies love to see. Sorry, that was a long-winded reply, but I hope it I hope it sort of answered what you're thinking. I can stop recording now. Is Priya? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'll stop I was recording just, just in case there are any off the record ones. <laughs>